Uh, first of all, I, my name's Ollie Coburn. Uh, I'm part of the leadership team at Basra. And um, I just want to say a big thank you to everybody that's that supported this webinar over the past few days. We've had a phenomenal amount of people try and sign up, um, way more than we ever thought would. So big, big thank you for that. Um, tonight, we've got Mike James with us. Uh, Mike is a graduate sport rehabilitator. That's where his, uh, his academic journey started, at least before that. He was a PTI in the British military. Uh, he's bit, gone on to study a physiotherapy degree, uh, master's in sports science, and he's got his strength and conditioning quals as well. So a very experienced clinician, wide range skill set, good academic history. Um, he also happens to be a very talented endurance athlete. So uh, Ironmans, ultramarathons, uh, including what should have been the MDS this year. So big reputation, big shoes to have on the webinar, which is always great. He's been very, very generous with his time uh, over the past few, uh, few days in particular, which we're very grateful for. So um, please be kind to him in the questions. <laughs> A little bit of housekeeping. Um, we're going to be posting some chat messages in, but we have turned chat off um, just because uh, it had the potential to get a little bit overwhelming with so many people in. Q&A, however, is still open. So if we don't any, answer any of your questions in advance, please get them posted. Uh, we'll do our best to answer as many as we can, either as we go along or at the end. So that's the intro. That's a, the housekeeping done. Mike, it's a pleasure. Um, I suppose we better dive in. We better cover the, um, the important stuff, first of all, and just really quickly touch on it. Um, from a data protection insurance clinical notes perspective we're not going to touch on that stuff too much tonight um, we are going to do another webinar in the future covering that um, but i think it's probably important and i'm sure you'd agree that you need to be on top of those things so if virtual consultations is something that you're going to transition into um, you know it's important to make sure you're appropriately indemnified for that uh, from a clinical notes perspective it doesn't work any differently to um, your notes as you would normally do them everything should be documented including your clinical reasoning uh, the history of all the tests that you've uh, done or tried to do the conversation that you've had etc and um, data protection is probably the biggest change so you need to make, make sure people are aware they're being recorded and that you may save images or audio from that consultation if that's what you're choosing to do um, and obviously the, the surroundings and the environment as well from a data protection perspective um, you may want somebody to be in a, a quiet environment uh, no other people around them that could hear or interfere with the conversation. So that's some of those things. Please, if you want to chat in more depth about any of that stuff, come and join us on the next webinar. Um, but let's get into the meat and bones of it all. Um, virtual consults, Mike, have been thrust upon us extremely quickly uh, with the recent circumstances. Um, but there are positives in this. So um, let's have a little chat about the benefits. So to the clinician, to the patient, what are your thoughts? How do you always approach it? Yeah, thanks, Ollie. So I think I love the word that you use, opportunity, because um, generally across all the therapists, we've got a bit of panic going on. People feel like this is a, a desperation move that they're forced into to, to try to be able to salvage some sort of business out of it. When in essence, this isn't a new thing. It's been around a long time. There are companies that exclusively work in in telehealth or online work and then there are others like myself who've been doing it to some degree for, for a number of years so the benefits to the therapist straight off the bat is the reach that you now have you are not limited by geography you're not limited by postcodes and the availability you have for people to come into your clinic you are now uh, access all areas to anyone anywhere in the world it also means that you can work from home, which obviously we're forced to do. But you're able to dictate your day and your working day in some degree beyond the scope of um, the usual type of clinic hours because of the flexibility of this type of system. From the client's point of view, from the patient's point of view, then they're sort of reciprocated. You now have open access to therapists. You have access to therapists that you may not have thought of seeing before. You have access to your existing therapist, despite the doors being closed, so to speak. But you also have, if you're someone who, and we all know 
as sports rehabilitators, we all know of those athletes who never really address the aches, niggles, pains that they they have. And all of a sudden now, someone's pressed pause on every match, every season, every event, every race, um, which all of us to some degree have, have been hurt by. Yeah. But that has presented an opportunity for people to address problems and niggles that they never thought they would or, or wouldn't have considered a priority before. Yeah. Absolutely. So suddenly there's, there's an opportunity for those. I think on a bigger picture, um, if we were on our soapboxes preaching a little bit, then I genuinely think from a therapist's point of view, we have the opportunity for the first, first large-scale opportunity to show just how easy self-management, reassurance, education, exercise prescription can be if applied properly to managing musculoskeletal and sporting problems. Yeah, I'm, I'm really glad you mentioned that because I think one of the, the big points that I came out with straight away when, uh, when everything was rapidly transitioning into virtual was some of the most powerful tools in your toolbox are advice, reassurance, education, exercise, and, and they're all things that you don't necessarily need to be in a room with someone to, to advise on. Um, so, you know, the really powerful, meaningful things that we do, um, you know, can, can still occur. And like you said, with the added benefit of additional reach, which is really cool. I remember we're talking, we're in the 90s here, but I was doing my sports science degree and um, we did a module on uh, disability sport. And one of the things we did was we all became impaired in some capacity for a day to, to live the life through the eyes of, of that sort of, of disability. Now, that was eye-opening. And if you imagine now, if someone had come into your clinic, you know, coronavirus wasn't going on, and someone was trying to sell the benefits of, of online consultation to you. And what they did one day was they walked into your clinic and they just tied your arms to your, to your body and just said, you're going to have a full clinic list today. You're going to have to do everything you normally do, but you cannot touch anyone. All of a sudden, we would have a, a heightened sense of ability and, and confidence, hopefully in our communications, our queuing, our coaching. And as sports rehabilitators, we may be able to argue that we have an advantage over the majority of other professionals, the other therapy professionals, because we are used to coaching, communicating, having people and groups in front of us, teams in front of us, and being able to use our voices and our explanations to facilitate people in a much better way than some others are. And this is, all, this is an extension of that. It's just allowing us to develop or, or sharpen some of those fundamental skills that we should be using anyway. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think probably one of the other things that follows on nicely from that, um, we've had this rapid transition, probably referring specifically now to those that might work in, in private sector uh, settings, so, so MSK clinics. Um, there's obviously a big shift away from how a, a client journey might start, if you like, if that's the, the appropriate term. Um, and I think what a lot of people have been getting flustered around is what is the step-by-step, -step, what's the process? Um, and we talked, I know, about it, how important it is to have a plan and a step-by-step and -step for that. Could you give us a bit of insight, maybe, as someone who's experienced in doing it, into what your step-by-step -step might look like and some of the things you, you ha always have in there? Yeah, absolutely. So the first thing to do before you do anything at all is work out who your customer target is. And for most of us right now, it's probably a time to really concentrate initially on those clients we already have on our books before potentially trying to find new ones. So the first thing most people should do is probably reach out and contact their existing client lists, their existing patient populations. Some of these people would have already been in the treatment system. So they may have sessions that have been cancelled. They may have sessions that they were due to plan to book in in the coming weeks and months. So reach out to these guys, let them know that you're still around, you're still functioning, you're still an operating business and a therapist who is fully capable of now still treating and helping. And you all have your own systems, whether it's via phone or email or, or any sort of automated communication systems. But use what you've got and reach out to these people and let them know. I think that would be the first thing to do before jumping the gun. Um, and often with these things, for myself, what I would do, and every, we've all got cross sections of, of patient populations. We've got different ages, different generations of people who are 
savvy or less savvy with tech. So how you approach some of these people for a young uh, IT literate person to suddenly go, that's cool. Ollie, I'll book in with you here. I know how you I know this works. Not a problem. But if you've got a 60, 70 year old grandmother and um, they are not fantastic with technology, then how you would approach those people may be different. So my advice would always be have a range of approaches for those people. So how I would approach my existing clients is I would reach out to them, let them know I'm still now functioning, I'm still around, I'm still able to help. And these are the options I have. I could contact you by an te old-fashioned telephone call. If there's any existing systems that you use, like a Skype or a FaceTime to speak to family and friends, then we can utilize those. Or I use other platforms, which are my preferred choice. And if you'd like to, I can help you with these. Um, I think it's nice initially maybe to, depending on the size of your client lists, whether you do it personally or via that autom automated response. Um, from there, you sort of have a template that you follow depending on the response. So it may be that some people need a taste of session. You know, okay, it's something I'm interested in, but I'm not quite sure of the value. The number one question that therapists always throw is, well, how can I see someone without getting my hands on them? And then likewise, the number one question the patients throw back is, well, how can you help me without getting your hands on me? So yeah. some people just need that little five-minute free phone call, free Zoom or whatever platform you're using, little session just to say, hi, hello, this is what we get you to do. This is an example of some of the stuff. Um, at Sports Injury Fix, we recorded a, a fictitious example session. Now, that's quite long. It's 30 minutes, and, and um, that's not necessarily what everyone needs to do. But just a quick five minutes back and forth to, to show them what, what, how it's going to evolve is quite a helpful thing. Then if you use online booking platforms, online booking services, then updating those processes. I think what I'm finding is a lot of therapists are learning the technicalities of using these systems and then forgetting the fundamental changes that need to go alongside it with their business. So um, setting up any automated templates, any emails and any notifications yeah, and stipulating what needs to go on there. The things like the links to the GDPR compliances, the privacy policies, simple things that we would do normally. So if you think of, um, when we, we all drive a car, most of us drive cars, we often jump on holidays or go away on, on training camps or whatever, and we drive in a different country. And all of a sudden, there's little things we need to tweak, but the fundamental skills are the same. And this is no different. So what would you need to have in place if you were physically opening a clinic or a second clinic or expanding your practice? You'd have to have some new administrative paperwork. You'd have to have some new booking system changes. You'd have to have some little things that are tweaked, and this is just the same. If you then decided to... Um, branch into recruiting new clients and potentially how you would advertise it and how would you market it would slightly need to change to help them into the client journey. And that would often be along the lines, my advice would be to just reinforce the fact that you can still help people despite yeah. the fact that you're, you're doing it remotely. Yeah, definitely. And I really like that comparison as well. Um, you know, I've not heard you use that one yet when we've had these discussions and, and it is, it's true. It's really, a really nice way of, of framing it. Um, in terms of getting into the, the meat and bones of it, because this really answers the question of, of how can I help? Um, we'll probably try and approach this a little bit structured. I know we, we said we were going to try and do that. We'll probably go off track at some point. But um, from a subjective perspective, I think one of the things for me that's uh, of heightened importance, it's obviously you know, very important anyway, um, is red flag screening. Um, so just let's hammer home some of the key points around, um, you know, screening somebody, having those conversations in your subjective, first of all, and then we can chat about any similar similarities or differences thereafter. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and I think it's, it's important to note that that red flag screening could be pre the appointment. You may send some paperwork, you may send some sort of health questionnaires, some screening questionnaires, you or someone might contact you. Yeah, someone might phone you to say, I'm interested in booking in, can I, can I book in? And during that conversation, you can just be on, on your vigilance for that type of stuff. And therefore, you know, when, when there is a suspicion of something that you deem 
a concern of significant concern that you need to forward on, then absolutely this is not an appropriate forum to be seeing people and be doing things with. So, but the subjective, including that red flag screening, is probably the bit that changes the least. Yeah. These, this is the thing where we communicate and we, we, we glean so much information from the subjective. What I would say is you should probably be more confident now because what you have done, and we'll come on to it in the objective, is we've naturally removed a, a, a pressure, a expectancy, and a time constraint that we would normally put into an objective assessment mm. to spend longer focusing on the subjective. We've probably all sat in clinic with that runner who comes in who's itching and they're making little sly looks at your, at your couch or your, your multi-gym or whatever you've got there because they want to get to that bit. And now you've got them. You've got them focused so you can really double down on that stuff. So from the red flag stuff, um, I know we chatted, there was going to be a link we were going to share to do with the NHS guidelines. Yeah, I've just put um, that in the chat actually. So yeah, that's a and, really and, helpful resource. Um, I mean, yeah. feel free to use it internationally, but particularly those guys that, that are in the UK, um, there's just some up-to-date information literally from a couple of days ago um, that's been put out by the NHS about screening for these red flag urgent conditions that re would require acute care. Um, so check yeah. out. I think for yeah. me, and although there's a couple, there's a couple of um, unique things in there to do with COVID nineteen patients, etc. Yeah. But fundamentally, there should be no catches or tricks in that document than people should be doing on a daily basis anyway. It's yeah. basic, basic red flag screening. I think one of the cha big changes for me uh, that that might be a little bit different doing something uh, across a screen rather than face to face is that I think. Some of the, the red flag questions can sometimes seem a little bit invasive or a little bit insensitive. And I think that's, that's an easier barrier to overcome when you sat in a room with somebody because, you know, you can use body language to communicate and, you know, it will come across differently than through a screen. Yeah. Um, and I yeah, think and expectation setting is really important with that, isn't it? It is. It is. But again, the communication starts prior to the assessment. So that pre-assessment paperwork or email whatever correspondence you have with them we'll have a chat we'll be asking certain questions i'll explain why we're going to be chatting about those questions and the thing i noticed from the from the therapists that i've spoken to who've recently taken up the online stuff the point i seem to be hammering home more about the subjective than anything else is don't rush into it if someone comes into your clinic into your practice normally, then there's that chit chat. There's that little five minute. How are you? How have you been since last week? How was the holiday you went on? How did your daughter's dance class go? The usual things that we talk about, because I think you're staring at the screen and someone's just staring back at you. And there's this, I'm feeling a bit pressured because I'm not familiar with this. And they are probably pressured because this is a bit weird. Then suddenly we try to um, convince them and jump into it to say, this is the right stuff. This is what we should be doing. Yeah. But build that rapport, build that therapeutic alliance. If it's an existing client, then by all means, you know, well, that was a bit more of a faff than I thought it would be. You know, sorry, it's mucking around. You can, luckily, I'm better at therapy than I am at tech. And you can really <laughs> mellow that conversation out. Um, and then it should, again, lead to the ease or a greater ease in asking those relevant questions. Yeah, absolutely. And then our other red flags, obviously. Um, we can still do the visual aspect. So, you know, if we're looking for things like, you know, signs of infection, severe deformities, things like that, it's a case of um, a little bit of preempting what might happen, you know, camera set up, make sure you've got space in your room, making them aware they might have to uh, be able to show you the affected area and that that might involve removing clothing or whatever. Um, but we can definitely still do that. So, you know, painful wrist, painful hand, really easy to show you. But, in essence, we could we could screen quite easily visually still for, for most of the other physical red flags. Yeah, and, and any of those physical tests, including the objective later, then it's really imperative that we're forceful and polite enough, but not shy to really explain things if they're not following it. Don't feel that, you know, he's not quite getting where I want him to be there or I can't quite get that into picture. And therefore that natural tendency to go, okay, I've tried to explain it a couple of times. He hasn't quite, or he or she hasn't quite got it. Let's skip on. 
Yeah. That's those danger zones where we can miss things. Whereas, you know, um, Clive, I'm showing my age now, I'm using Clive as an Ooh. example. Clive, you know, Clive that camera's not... Clive yeah, and Clive. That, <laughs> That's not quite where I needed to be. Sorry if I'm not explaining myself well enough, but can you just move your camera a little bit? Can you just tilt it a little bit or lift your arm up slightly higher? I really want to get the best view of that I can. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Thanks very much. So it's, it's a quite good, you know, laptops and computers are fantastic, but if you've got someone that you think either the body part they've got a problem with or the assessment movement screen type thing, you're going to ask them to do warrants more mobility and flexibility then using mobile phones or mobile devices is a much easier way to do it right can you just pop that on the floor take a couple of steps back turn to face me perfect so yeah. be forceful enough to really get them to follow those instructions and again i have uh, have slightly more confidence talking to a group of sports rehabilitators to say to do that than maybe some of the other professional therapists that, that we work with because they have a certain personality type generally that are more comfortable having that instructional teaching type element to their game yeah i'm gonna i'm, I'm gonna jump in with one question because someone's posted it which is a really great great question so michelle thank you so she's asking about patient consent which is something that we didn't really touch on the practicalities of um, earlier and there are a number of ways of doing it personally um, i use an online form through google docs google forms um, and get people to sign up through there. Uh, that has an explanation on it of um, everything that's going to happen and the data protection implications and everything else. Um, how do you do it, Mike? And what are some of your other thoughts? So that would be my gold standard. I think yeah. that's what everyone should strive to get to. Um, if you, from a business point of view, or just wanting to help your clients' point of view, want to get started and then evolve those sort of practices later on, then there's a couple of options that you can think about. Um, there are many people, regulated bodies, who will accept the fact that because someone has accepted your invitation and then activated the call, then yeah. they've given consent. Most of these, as we're doing with this, they have a recording facility. So make sure to gain consent verbally to record or in, in, a, in a documented form if you're using that. And then when recording... Record so like, for example, yeah. we're recording now. Um, this, this audio can be, be saved separately, so it, it would literally be a case of, Mike, we need to go through your subjective assessment and, out, and I need to look at your shoulder. Would it be okay um, if you removed your T-shirt for me so that we can assess that? Is that okay? Yeah, yeah. And, and again, really it, yeah, and, and we all... We all trust our practices that, you know, we operate with the theory being, would I stand up in a court of law if, if the worst case ever happened? Now, I would much rather go into a court of law with an audio or video recording of someone giving me consent, followed by everything that I said and did with these people, than sometimes my documented notes, because this seems a much stronger argument. So, so consent can be gleaned a couple of ways. Uh, verbally would be more than adequate for most of us. But if you can kick on to get some documented consent and maybe the verbally recorded stuff, then even better. You're just watertight. Uh, on the recording, just to, to smash out another one of the questions, um, recording's fine, but there's, t there's two things with it. Make sure the patient knows you're recording. That's extremely important. Make sure they've consented to you recording it. Um, and then make sure you're saving it and storing it appropriately. Um, so, you know, encrypted uh, if it's going on a cloud somewhere you know fully pass password protected or saved on a, a kind of hard drive or, or solid disk that can be locked away somewhere and that is safe and secure so save it with whatever your local uh, data protection legislation tells you to do recording's fine as long as you've got the consent and obviously if the patient's not happy with it being recorded um, get the written consent don't record it um, I think mo I think most platforms like this um, and other kind of video specific video consult softwares will all have an option to to not record or or record. Yeah. Uh, cool. Right. That was a little bit of a sidetrack, but the questions were good, um, and it brought 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 us back to a, to a good point. Um, so, yeah, I think we've we've probably touched on all the key points with subjective. Um, we obviously don't need to do too much hand-holding in telling people what needs to be in the subject if it's actually no different to what you do in person. 
it's exactly the same and, and in whatever clinical format you would normally follow um, I, I'd probably urge people not to really change that process from what they normally do because then you'll then get flustered and have more tendency to miss stuff so keep it the same don't change it and, and, and do I, I, the general feedback I get of people and it's exactly my experience as well is it's actually better this way because there's less distractions you're just listening to someone um, you know cross your arms sit back let them do their two minutes of talking like yeah. we're all supposed to be doing and let them speak make you know the only thing I communicate sometimes is even if I'm recording sometimes I have a little notepad or I might have their existing notes if they're a client that I've seen before yeah so um, I do express to them look if I'm looking down and I'm making some notes then Please, I'm not being rude. I'm just making some documented notes for your fo folder or your file. Um, but the subjective bit, most people find more benefit from than less benefit. Yeah, absolutely. I'm getting a couple of questions just about what, what are rules and regs for other countries. Don't know, guys. Can't advise you. Um, but definitely, definitely check and reach out with your local governing bodies for sure. Um, yeah, and if you and, and again, depending on the country, then... Um, be very careful. I've spoken to therapists in the past who are US based yeah. and because everything is, is uh, legislation is run at state level, then even if they were to do telehealth stuff with someone cross state, interstate, occasionally there's slight rules and regs and TNCs that are different between states. So, so check with your regulating body, bodies, your insurers, and, and they'll give you the answers that you need. Yeah, for sure. Right, let's dive into objective then, because this is where things get a little bit more tasty. Um, so I, I don't know where you normally start with with, with an objective. We've, we've covered observations already as part of our subjective and, and red flag screening. Um, so I guess from there, you might go to range of motion active tests. So uh, what are, the, what are you, your top tips, golden rules? How are you going to conduct this? Yeah, so... This is the chance to be inventive and innovative. There are, there's so much more that you can do than, than you think. There are obvious things that become almost impossible. As we've mentioned, hands-on stuff, certain neuro testing, certain sort of palpation test. tests. Are just, yeah. However, you can be quite inventive with them. So, so it would depend on, on the client in front of me where I start, but certainly range of movement tests. They could, they could do active stuff themselves. They could do some basic strength testing. You could apply some resistance of whatever they've got at home to, to enhance some of that resisted testing. Yeah. Functional testing is, is absolutely fine as long as they've got the this, this space. You just may need to be a little bit more selective in the tests you do. Um, you can even get them to do some neuro tests themselves. If you wanted things like touch and feel, you know, or um, sort of uh, dermatomal stuff, then you could guide them and, and screen them through the process of how to do it and yeah. then just get their feedback yeah. from it. Um, you know, I've certainly had people doing slump tests, modified slump tests on themselves, for example. You just talk them through it. Now, I know uh, I've been communicated with Tom Goom about it. Tom is really good at sending them videos, PDFs, things in advance of these are some of the objective tests that I'm going to get you to do that may be a little bit more complicated. So rather than us sucking up so much time in the session, here's a little bit of advance notice and you can learn them and try them and we can go there. You know, yeah. I've had people do um, a modified Thessaly's test on themselves using the equipment they've got around them. You can easily, it's not perfect, there's Probably important to say, you, I, I don't even think you need the equipment. I mean, I've had someone doing rehab before that had no equipment, but used uh, a, a bucket with some water in it. And if yeah. they wanted it heavier, they'd put more water in. And if they wanted it lighter, they'd pour some out. Um, so it really can be as simple as that, but it comes down to being yeah. a bit creative with it. Yeah. yeah. It's, I think it's important to not do too much yeah. in the objective. And, and then, because you'll find a way to make it awkward and difficult if you want to. However, if we've spent longer and we've been a bit more thorough in that subjective, then in essence, we should have less to worry about in the objective anyway. Yeah. But certainly um, movement assessments, um, uh, endurance tests and, and things like that, there's no reason you can't get enough to solidly confirm a working hypothesis and a couple of differential diagnoses and then be able to move forward from there. Just yeah. think of it as a simplification of what you would already do 
and you can, you know, as you said, special tests aren't that special. You can get someone to do some modified one if you wanted to themselves, but are they really going to make a difference in what your rehab or your working plan will be? Probably not. No. So again, there's that. And you're going to come back and reevaluate that anyway. You're going to, yeah. as, as yeah. you would in person, you would implement some intervention. Um, you would then retest acutely. So, you know, within session, okay, maybe we maybe can't do that, but what we certainly could do is follow up after 24, 48 hours. And then the rehab that we've applied becomes additional feedback uh, and adds yeah. to our working diagnosis. Yeah. So there's more, there's more that, that you can do than you can't. One of my top advices, you know, if, if, there's, if there's guys watching and you work in a practice together, but now you're all based at home, or you've got friends, colleagues, peers that you, you know and trust, then A, as a process of practicing this stuff, then do a little call to each other, make sure you're comfortable with the tech, and then do some mock sessions, play around with some stuff, see if you can invent modifications to certain things, see which things work, don't work, and just play around with them. It's not going to cost you anything than a bit of time and effort. Um, and then you'll work some of those things. You know, most of us now have um, professional careers that focus within certain remits. You know, myself working in the endurance world, then I've got half a dozen to 10 tests that I need to really get through with most people. And that covers the majority of the things I see. Yeah. If someone suddenly yeah. tomorrow got in touch saying I've got problem X and I used to see in problem Y and Z, then I might have to think on my feet a little bit more. But most of us think of the, the type of people that you see, the type of clients that you normally see and the things you normally do and what, what can work and what can't work from those things in an objective assessment that I can make work in this. In this. What coaching cues do I need? What, what space and... Um, Kwin coaching type things do I need to get it to work? I think one of the other really good tips I, I got given as well, and I, I can't take the credit personally, but a lot of the these tech platforms, if you play around with them, you could, you've got screen share functions. So someone said to me, well, how about go on YouTube, pull up a video of the objective test that you want somebody to do and show them that video through the screen share and then say, right, can you go and try that for me? And that covers all your bases then because some of us are better at communicating than others and we might find it easier to describe the test verbally um, and and same from a, a patient understanding as well they they may not understand it verbally but as soon as they see it visually it makes perfect sense and um, yeah. so using There's multiple also methods of, of communicating it as well yeah and certainly on zoom um there's a little fancy thing called a virtual background yeah. So you could, I've seen, there's a, there's a lot of personal trainers that I'm working with and they put the program, the whole sort of overview of their program behind them so that when they're talking, the athletes are looking at the program and the exercises and they're just pointing to different things. Um, just, just playing around with stuff and, and seeing what, what works for you. Yeah. And when it comes to rehab, I mean, um, what we can't do is just be with somebody in a gym or in the clinic or wherever, whatever setting we're working in, um, we can't kind of visually, physically tweak movements. You know, if we're trying to get them to do a squat in a particular way and we want them to, to move a joint position or something like that, we can't do that anymore. Um, so cueing becomes really important, doesn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I say it's, it's, I think it's where a lot of therapists are now scrambling. It's where yeah. they're really having to upskill themselves to, to really think about those things because perhaps they don't. But um, sports rehabilitators are from, from a, a background in exactly this stuff. So this should be the stuff that we just know. You know, I, I can help you with movement cues and coaching cues, keeping it simple, a couple of instructions, and then however you want to follow that up on, on sort of summary at the end of the session is, is different then. Yeah, it's where some strength and conditioning knowledge really comes in handy um, and having a bit of experience of actually coaching um, from a, a performance perspective, not just from a, a rehab perspective, because you tend to find that when it's performance, there's more emphasis on cueing things and making smaller changes and being able to verbalise that. Um, and I'd, I'd probably say for the people out there that aren't as familiar with doing that stuff, practice it, um, and because that's the only way to get good. Yeah, definitely. And, and again, keep it simple. 
there's so many ways to progress an exercise and coach that exercise without bringing out MSCs and PhDs to try and overcomplicate stuff. You know, just keep it simple. Give them less. Less is more, definitely, in this case. Um, and, and, and you'll find you'll get comfortable at starting to give less pretty quickly. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And focus in key exercises, which are the most bang for my book, you know. Um, I know it's the other things with there's multiple tools out there that we can use to prescribe exercise. Um, Penny, for your thoughts on those, do you use any the, the kind of apps and the exercise? So, stuff yeah, so I personally don't um, because of my background. My background is I like to be very specific and bespoke with the people in front of me. Obviously, they do follow themes based on the population that I tend to see. But I tend to do it one of two ways. Um, my preference is normally to, so I saw a guy yesterday, I did a consult yesterday with a guy with um, some insurgent bicep problem. So I explained what I needed him to do and he went through it on the, um, on the session and then I literally jumped off the call, set up my mobile phone and, and spent a minute recording the exercises with a couple of key win points myself and then pinged the video across to him. It was an extra minute within my admin time for that session, but it gave him a real specific, and I, you know, I was sort of, um, I addressed the video by name, told him the exercises by name, and just gave him those to work on. Yeah. And that could be fundamentally different to the next person and the next person and the next person. I don't have any problems with people sending pictures and images or YouTube links. And likewise, there's some fantastic exercise prescription software out there. Yeah, um, you know, I, I've got and, and a, lot of, friends. a lot as well where you can add your own videos into that. So in your yep. scenario, if you feel that yep. somebody may benefit from being able to track their progress and feed that back through an app, uh, and have something that will actually um, kind of give them a nudge to complete stuff, then you know, absolutely yep. nothing wrong but with it is, loading folk stuff to those. Yeah, those no, but it's important to have a range of options. Like absolutely. at the start when I said there's there's plenty of platforms you can do this on. So the first question for me when someone wants to book or inquires about an online is, what format would you feel comfortable with? And they might already say, oh, Zoom's fantastic for me. I use it in work. Or can we do it on FaceTime, can, whatever. And although I prefer them to do it on one than the other, I'll bend to whatever they need. It's me that needs to be more flexible than them. So likewise, come into the uh, exercise prescription side. That's the, normally the question I say. There's a range of ways that I can deliver these exercises to you what would you feel most comfortable with? Um, you know, they, they may have, uh, you may have someone with a learning disability who needs it a certain way compared to something else. Yeah. Maybe someone who just goes, yeah, a video works well for me, um, but I don't need you to spend time going off and filming something. If you've got something, you can send me a YouTube link to, perfect. Yeah. Well, I've even had some times. You can't use an app. Yeah, exactly. It's it, 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 a perfect example, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So there's been times in the past where, and it's a lag, is a delay with it but you might literally get the old matchstick men drawings out and post it old school to someone, snail mail. Yeah. Um, it's whatever works for them. If you're trying to ask them, they've already had to bend. They've already had to find a way of working with you, which may or may not be their preferred choice. So the less change you can give them, the, the better. Um, but it just, it's whatever works for you and, and, and what helps them the best. Yeah, hundred percent. And so we're, we're not just exercise buffs. Um, we, we do throw some manual therapy in there, some hands-on, when we can actually get in a room with people. Um, and we're not in the midst of a, a global pandemic. So I've had so many conversations, I, I've lost count, um, with practitioners who say, well, uh, a lot of my work is manual therapy-based, and I'm finding it really hard and a real challenge to transition to virtual. Um, but I know you've got some really good thoughts and ideas around instructing people to do their own therapy and things that we can do there yep. so i'm not going to intervene i'm just going to sit back and, and listen because this is going to be as helpful for me as it is for, for everybody else yeah so i think again it's not trying to overcomplicate things so for example if you are a manual therapist or some sort of massage therapist soft tissue person then normally at the end of your treatment session in clinic you generally say here's a couple of self-help things you could do at home until i see you next could be some trigger point balls, could be some foam rolling, it could be some self soft tissue work or any any of those tools and applications. So why not just 
become that conduit now to pass on the knowledge of how to do those things. So you may well, if you're someone who, who has a client base who need that interaction, you could just do a 30-minute session where you're doing it with them or talking them through it, and it becomes like a one-on-one -on -one coaching session um, or a series of videos that you could link in, similar to the, to the exercise stuff. Um, we've certainly done one with some massage therapists lately where we recorded a way of showing them self-help massage techniques. Yeah. Um, so there's a range of ways, whether you demo stuff, instruct things, or um, <clears throat> walk them through it. And again, it might just, you know, we hopefully have a finite length of time that this is going to be affecting us all. We don't really know what that is, but we're, yeah, fingers crossed. But, we're, you know, it's short to medium term, hopefully. So if it is a case of someone that you already have in your system that you do lots of manual stuff with, look, this is going to bridge the gap to get us back to the time that we can be back in clinic together and get my hands on you. Let's, let's go this way. It's better than nothing. If it's a new person, it might be, here's some things to get the ball rolling. Hopefully it makes such a difference. You never need to come and see me, but potentially you will when, when the cloud is lifted. Um, but there are options. It's, it's the one category of therapists that um, I seem to have had the biggest change in thinking with, that this is now a possibility. There is definitely things you can do. Um, Sports Injury Fix, again, we recorded a mock instructional video with this one, the two of us just pretending someone had some soft tissue injuries and we gave them some stuff via a, via a link for them to go and play around with. And that's all available for people to check out. So, um, but again, be inventive with it. So how could I instruct this? I, it doesn't matter if you've never had to do it before. Have a play with it. You know, if I wanted to teach someone how to do this, how would I do it? And you'll make mistakes. You'll have a thousand outtakes for, for, for memories to laugh at in the future. Yeah. But film yourself. Try it all out. See how you get on. You might find that what you're doing is perfect and the camera angle is perfect, but you're just sort of spouting a little bit of nonsense in, in your description, in your narrative, and you refine that a little, a little bit. But there's definitely, definitely ways to continue. Um, it's, it's, I guess, if we're trying to find a buzzword, you can be hands-on whilst being hands-off yeah. during this period. If you, if you get inventive. And you can also, uh, if somebody's in, in circumstances where it'll work, draft in a bit of help. You know, there's no harm yeah. in, in saying, right, okay, grab a, uh, your partner, grab a friend, family member, whatever it is, and we'll teach them how to do a very simple soft tissue technique. Or there's a particular stretch that you might need some assistance with. So, you know, here's how they can help do it. And again, it comes down to that thing of camera setup and being able to, to mess about with a mobile phone and whatnot. Um, but definitely all, also an option, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Nothing's, nothing is off the table here. There are things that become very, very difficult to do, but you're limited by your imagination in this stuff. The online spectrum, you are limited by your imagination. Yeah, definitely. Um, cool. So I, I know that that covers a lot of the clinical stuff and it's probably um, an important point to just, or important time to just jump in and say that for everyone that's registered for the webinar uh, through Zoom, uh, we're going to send you out the resources that Sports Injury Fix have put together. Um, massive shout out to the the whole team at SIF uh, because over the last few weeks they've been like hamsters on a wheel producing this content and bringing it all together, and it's it's so helpful um, and it's all in one place. So there's access to the videos that are together, the blog posts. You know, all of which Mike's contributed to. So um, everyone that's registered is going to get a link for those. We'll send those out. Please check them out. That will probably um, reinforce and, and cover a lot of what we've talked about and probably a little bit more as well. Um, so, yeah, 100% go and look at those um, and, and get in touch. I know Mike's already mega busy, but I'm sure he's going to be happy to help with, uh, with the, the rest of the team at SIF as well. So, uh, so use them, and that that probably gets us to the to the end of our clinical chat stuff. Other than to say, please reach out if you do have more questions, um, and we'll we'll try and cover little bits in the Q and A at the end. One of the other big things we talked about, and I know you put a video out about the Joe Wicks effect, was how can we we adapt? Again, this is probably aimed at the business owners of the private practice crowd. Um, how can we adapt our 
um, the ways in which we attract new patients to our clinic in these times and how can we use our knowledge and our skills to improve the health of our communities as well because that's another really important part of our role public health part of our role to encourage people to be active and etc um, so yeah fire because yeah, you're, the, you're, you're, some, you're some, the man for this kind of stuff yeah and i think like social media in the last 10 days has literally become the wild west there, there, there's the rule book has been torn up and people are doing all sorts of weird and wonderful things and what i'm starting to see the trend in is people starting to lose their base identity they're trying to think they need to change and adapt when they've all got a unique skill set and a unique avenue they can go down and you mentioned the joe wicks paradox that i was talking about is there's people who are getting annoyed getting frustrated that people are offering this simple baseline advice but likewise not everybody needs that some people need more complex stuff from the public health stuff i think there's a few things that i i've thought about personally with this stuff number one there is a lot of sportsmen athletes runners are massive for this where there has been so much of their life livelihood taken away from them so they can't meet for their club sessions they can't meet for their training runs they can't meet for their training sessions as clubs and now they're all sitting around in a time slot where things would be occupied that now isn't. So something I started to do, which was to cover a few bases, was I started reaching out to all the local running clubs, triathlon clubs near me, and offering a free Facebook Live. All they need to do is let you into the group and set up a Facebook Live and you're good to go. And I did it during times when these clubs were um, due to be on a training session. And it was just a free for all Q and A. Some sent pre questions in in advance, and some just threw them out while I was there. And I spent an hour of my time um, with everything from, depending on the size of the club, anywhere from twenty to two hundred people in these forums. And it was free advice of what they can do to train right now, some injury advice, what they can do to keep strong, things to think about with their running or their training. And at the end of it, of course, there was a little soft lean to. By the way, I'm doing online consultations. If there's something you want to chat about more, if there's yeah. something you want to spend more time talking about, you can book in to see me. Now, some people will have just thought, oh, that was quite helpful, free advice, and will just maybe tip the hat to me in the street in months, years to come. Some people might take me up for the online booking, and some people maybe six months, year from now, when they pick up that injury, will go, oh, I remember that guy who did the Facebook Live. I might be able to go and see him in his clinic or whatever. So so that's an option. I think you may expand your remit. Perhaps you will offer class sessions online. Perhaps you will offer something that is outside your normal wheelhouse and that becomes still, a string still to your within, Still within scope. I mean, someone's still put, within scope someone's but outside big, your company. Big cat clock statement. Yeah. And Francine, yeah, 100% yeah. agree with you yeah. there. And again, for some people, some of these avenues to either recruit people in the short term or long term maybe a string to the bow they never thought of using, and it's only in the short term. I will lose my facility. I will not be able to pay my staff or myself if I don't do these things. But it's so far out of my comfort zone that as soon as things go back to normal, that's just a memory. And others might find that, you know what, these are avenues to help people generate income and think about stuff that, that is something I really want to move forward for. The other avenues to think about things are twofold. I think we've all got stuff that we want to do in our business lives that we never get round to do, whether it's painting your clinic, whether it's upgrading your admin process, spring cleaning your business from top to bottom. Yeah. Now we unfortunately probably have a bit of time to do that. And then finally, I think unfortunately we are going to be left with a situation where a lot of people will survive and recover from coronavirus and we'll need a lot of rehab and recovery and we're yeah, perfectly massively. suited to help these people. Yeah. So sitting down and planning how you could do that in months and weeks to come is probably something that will be a good thing to do for the public, but also for your business when we're all trying to get back on our feet, probably an avenue we should look at. Yeah. And probably one of the other things I want to touch on, and I'll, I'll float my own boat just a little bit because I actually made, made it onto international radio uh, the other day with this. So please, please, please be an advocate for people's health as well in a general sense, you know, within your own community and your own network of friends and family and things like that. Um, be that person that people can reach out to 
if they're if they're unsure and certain lots of people are struggling with the mental health obviously it's not necessarily within scope to help them directly with their mental health you can be a person to talk to and try and come up with ideas and initiatives to to keep people active keep people moving because it will massively help them with these things and you know because the current situation that we're in is affecting everybody so little practical example i set up for my running club um, a virtual club runs group on facebook so what we do we would normally have a session every monday every wednesday we meet up 50 60 of us and there's a planned session okay so we took that idea and instead we flipped it and made it fun so the first one that we did was you're allowed to run a route any route you want between 5 and 10k and you have to go past as many pubs as possible and you're going to you're going to screenshot your strava you're going to post it in the comments and we're all going to have a laugh and see you run. Um, and it, it's little things like that uh, and because this is the perfect time to do it you've got a little bit more time on your hands um, and you can be a really engaged helpful member of your community and that goes a long way people will appreciate that so I, something i definitely encourage yeah again and the other thing I, I well i think the community started doing it around here with me but i've tapped into it as well I've always advocated to professionals to network, whether it's other sports rehabilitators or other therapists or things like fitness professionals, dietitians, counsellors, psychiatrists, psychologists, to just have those bigger reach within the community. And like you said there, when it comes to things like mental health, well-being, then we can't go outside of our scope of practice. We can just be nice, decent human beings and help out. But if there are people that you now suddenly have more time to reach out, start communicating with trying to help them help other people and vice versa then certainly you know there was a there's a medical there's a fourth year medical student in my town who's kindly off she's been sent home obviously from uni and uh, kindly offered in the local facebook group to walk people's dogs shop for the vulnerable and just basically just be a really decent person yeah so the first thing i did was just send her a little message going fantastic what you're offering I'm an MSK therapist. I've got a bit of experience. If you ever wanted to chat while you're home about how MSK links with medicine and my experiences of working in the NHS or whatever, then please feel free to, to pick up the phone. You're doing something decent for someone else. I'll do something decent for you. Yeah. Um, she's, she's not phoned, so she obviously doesn't <laughs> me. Yeah. You but they are just, they're just, you and most of those things, bit. yeah, most of those things are just um, decent human being stuff. They're nothing more than that. Yeah, and it, it definitely, to an extent, falls within scope. You know, we all have a responsibility to look after the health of the people around us, um, whether we're getting paid for it or not, especially at a time like this. I think our, our skills are so skills and knowledge are so valuable um, that it, it's responsible to share them, I think, uh, in a meaningful way. Yeah, absolutely. Sure. absolutely. Um, we're getting tons of questions. Um, I'm, I'm trying to pick out a theme to see if I can kind of knock four or five out. So... I've got a few around, probably linked together. So uh, how long would you spend with someone on, a, on an online consult? Would you alter your prices um, and just typically ballpark fee? I know fee is going to waver where you are in the country and who you see and things like that. But um, yeah, some thoughts and I can get rid of a few questions yeah. then. Yeah, re really good questions, really typical questions that we're getting asked lots lately. Um, so fundamentally... It's up to you and your business and how you work to decide on what you're going to charge someone. Some people, and I have not got a problem with this, some people fall off the thinking of they're paying for my time, knowledge, and experience, and the years it's taken to gain that time, knowledge, and experience. Therefore, my fees won't change, and they justify that themselves that way. Some people, and I do this myself, um, they have a pro rata fee. So depending on the time, so my follow-up appointments are the same length, same time duration as my uh, in-clinic ones, 30 minutes, but my new patients would normally be an hour, and now that's a 45-minute session, just because there is that element of uh, reduced objective testing. So I then basically have prorated my fee for my 60-minute session down to a 45-minute session. What is really important with this stuff is although you may need to reduce fees as an introductory offer, particularly for those people who are reluctant to take you up on it, then likewise, at the same time, you really can't undervalue or undersell yourselves or your business. That's the key thing here. You are a professional and people are paying for your services. Yeah. 
they're paying for the outcome, not necessarily the time that they spend with you is, is the way that I would always encourage people to think about it. Um, and it's the same in a face to face setting, you know, it's people come to you with a, with a problem and you know, they're in pain fundamentally and they don't want to be in pain anymore. Um, and your skills, knowledge, and advice will help resolve that situation for them. And it's that resolution that, that it is what the fee is for, uh, rather than yeah. how long it takes to get there and, and, and whatnot. Yeah. But again, be, be, be prepared to be flexible. You know, I, I, live, um, I live in a small little town just outside Cardiff, which is quite an affluent town. And there's probably a lot of people that, that live in the town I live that are completely unaffected financially by, by this current circumstances. Likewise, not far down the road for me is a town that's fundamentally crippled probably by, by what's going on. And if someone there reached out wanting to be flexible with the fees compared to maybe someone locally to me, then I'd have to consider if I can help them in any shape or form. As long as I'm not underselling or undervaluing myself, then it may be something I should be flexible on. Yeah, absolutely. Because, um, it, again, it comes back to that thing, doesn't it, of let's help people in, a, in, a, in their time of need. I've taken out loads of questions here. Sorry, I look like I'm not paying attention, but I really am. Uh, I'm just trying to read through them all. Um, thank you for all the lovely feedback as well, guys. And, and those of you on Facebook, I'm trying to keep my eye on some of the Facebook comments coming in on my phone. Um, so hi to everyone that said hello there. Hi, Gary, if you're still watching. Um, okay, Q&A time. So let's see if we've got any more questions coming in. If you've got a burning question, now is the time to ask uh, because I am reading through them. Uh, what apps do people use uh, personal preference there are loads out there um, I've used numerous stuff in the past I know uh, all our Bazrat crowd due to recent events will be very familiar with Rehab Guru uh, we're actually holding a webinar on Friday with those guys to discuss their platform specifically uh, and some of the other issues that me and Mike touched on earlier around insurance uh, data protection etc so for the, those of you in the UK who are watching uh, maybe worth tuning in for that one um, but yeah do have a look around and um, see what works for you uh, video calling zoom a lot of these apps have stuff built in uh, i know this whatsapp facetime all the other stuff and uh, hopefully that covers off some of the app questions uh, let's go to the recent comments this is so helpful thanks jess very kind of you uh, okay Cool. Right. I think that's it for the, for the questions, Mike. Um, anything you want to throw out there? Anything you want to add? I mean, I'm just going to chuck a quick poll up because I, I want to just get a feel for if anyone else would be interested in doing these again in the future. So uh, you should have just seen a poll thing pop up if you want to answer that for us, guys. I'll leave that running for a minute. Uh, any, anything you don't think we've touched on, Mike? Any closing thoughts? Anything you want to chat about? doesn't even have to be rehab related. We've still got kind of a minute left to get through some bits. Yeah. No, I think I think from this stuff, the, the, the take-home message I'm always trying to give people with this is, at first this may be a scary, it may be something that feels a little bit weird to people, but you should really embrace this, even if it's short or long-term, as I mentioned. I first started doing this about five years ago from my coaching lifestyle. I was seeing athletes from all over the world or people who were away on training camps. I did no therapy by it. I was just doing coaching, and that was probably a bit simpler. And then I started embracing it with the therapist stuff and, and, and I made mistakes. It was tough. It was, I, I got things wrong. I was many times the appointment didn't happen because the link was broken or whatever. But as with anything in our profession or within life, a little bit of practice and you get better at it. You don't need to overcomplicate it. Keep it as simple as you need and your clients or patients need. And it may end up being something that's really useful for you. As far as, um, with all the setup stuff from myself personally or uh, on any of my things as the endurance physio or with sports injury fix, then please reach out for any help you ever want. Um, we offer free advice at sports injury fix and I will reply to anyone who messages me with any questions, anything someone might not want to ask in this sort of forum, or if there's any questions here that haven't been answered, then I'm, I'm more than happy to spend some time answering them. But yeah, it's, Mike, it's, it's Mike and myself are both on Twitter. We can often be found sending each other stupid gifts. Um, so yeah, yeah, yeah. are you the, at the Endurance PT is at, that right at the Endurance PT on Twitter and the Endurance Physio and everything else and anyone who sends a question via a silly gif will get an answer immediately <laughs> um, <laughs> gif, gifs yeah. are the way forward gifs are the way forward that is how it's done 
Um, I think from my end, I, what I would ju just say, uh, we are going to send these resources out. So everyone's going to get an email uh, in due course. So anything that we've talked about tonight uh, will be covered in the resources that we send you. And included in there will be contact details um, for Mike through SIF. And there'll be links to his social media and stuff like that as well. So you can track him down uh, and ask him your questions. I am really sorry if we've not managed to answer them live, but I literally cannot keep up. I'm getting, I mean, we've still got, somehow we've still got 400 plus of you listening to our, our dulcet tones on a, on a Wednesday evening, which is phenomenal. Um, so thank you for your support. Um, we're going to get signed out because uh, I've not had my dinner yet, so I want to go and eat. Uh, we will end it there. But on behalf of, of everyone at Bazrat Mike and, and probably everybody uh, watching as well, because some of these comments are great, just want to say a massive thank you for being so generous with your time, uh, sharing your, your advice, your knowledge with us. Because now more than ever, I think people, uh, people really appreciate that. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks for the invite. Stay safe. Stay well, everyone. I think yeah. one of the massive benefits I'm seeing here is the profession the therapy professional world is coming together like never before we're all helping each other out we're crossing down boundaries and breaking down barriers and and it's in it, it's really heartwarming to see yeah absolutely um, i'm just going to check us out of, of facebook so we, we're done there now bud um we will catch up no doubt uh, at some yes. stage so i will see you on twitter for for everybody that's tuned in uh, we're going to end this now so you'll probably get cut off once again, thank you for watching from wherever in the world uh, you did watch and we will be in touch with you soon.